Right, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Is that okay at the back? Excellent. Um, so yeah, my name's Ben Sheeran. Uh, I work at Tohoku University and I run the extensive reading program at the university. I also help with the language school. Cambridge English is a small language school in Senda. And so I do the reading program for children, teenagers, and adults there. Today, I'm mainly going to be talking about children, so children's reading programs. Um, I'm hoping to speak for about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, I hope we'll have some time at the end if you have any questions. And I will be here all day until 3 o'clock. So if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, please do. Just come and grab me and say hello. Uh, I speak English and Japanese and a bit of Spanish. So if you want to talk to me in any of those languages, that's okay. Okay, let's get started. The handout <coughs> is not very important, to be honest. Uh, it's just a list of the things I'll talk about. So you don't need it in front of you. Uh, this PowerPoint I will put up on my blog later, so you'll be able to check that if you want to. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about today, uh, why reading is important, and I just want to talk a bit about this because I think it's very important to tell students why it's important, and it's important to tell parents why it's important. Um, then I'm going to talk about the pieces of a program, what kind of um, sections there should be in a reading program, and then the order that children should learn reading skills. Actually, anyone should learn reading skills, not just children. Um, actually, this very basic reading program we use with children and teenagers who come to us for the first time, and also adults. If we get a beginner adult, we'll use this same very simple reading program. So I think it's applicable to lots of different cases. Then we'll talk about a couple of activities and materials. And then finally, some problems. So I think this is about four or five common problems that come up when you teach reading. So I'll talk about each of those. And finally, the last thing is uh, what to do after the simple program. So once the students can read, what should they do after that? So we'll just go through this. So why is reading important? Um, for me, the most important reason is that it's, it's, it's a very powerful way to learn a language. It's like magic. So it's probably the only way that you can learn a language without studying and without trying really hard. Just by reading interesting things, you can learn a language very, very quickly. And in fact, I think it's the only way to learn enough language. For me, uh, I realized this when I was in junior high school, in secondary school. So in England, we have to learn French. So we already speak English. So as a, as a second language, everybody learns French. And I hated French when I was 12, 13. It was difficult. It was embarrassing. Uh, I didn't like the class, I didn't like the activities, talk to your friend in French, I like, no. But when I was 40 or 15, I think actually 15 more likely, um, our teacher told us to read two books over the summer holidays in French. And these were not graded readers, or these were real French books. And so I started reading, it was very hard. And, but it got a little bit easier. But when I finished these two books, just two books, my French was much better. And I changed. I started enjoying the French classes. And so for me, it's a really big, important change. And I want to do the same for my students, to give them that, that kind of spark of language. When I first came to Japan, I was an ALT in a junior high school, and I thought, okay, for my job, what should I do? And I looked at my students, and I said, okay, they can't speak junior high school student. My, my school wasn't so great. So I said, okay, my job is to do speaking, because my students can't speak. So I did lots of speaking activities. And then after about a year, 
So I'm quite a slow learner. After a year or so, I thought, wait, my students can't understand me. Right? And if you can't understand, speaking is kind of useless, right? So I started doing listening. Let's do lots of listening activities. But after another year or two, I realized my students' language development wasn't enough for listening. And so I kind of hit on reading. So I think reading is a really good foundation for all the other language skills. And in Japan, it's probably the easiest way for students to get input. In other countries, listening might be a good way to get input. Because, for example, in France or in Spain, there's a lot of English language. Music, movies, TV. But in Japan, we don't have that kind of environment. English language music is not so popular. Um, the TV, there's not much English on it. So I think for my students at least, reading is the best way to get input. And of course, if you look at the Japanese school system, I think reading is probably the most important skill for my students, if they want to succeed academically. So all the tests are almost all reading, and students that are good at reading will have a real advantage at school. Now, tests are not the most important thing, <coughs> but especially for a private school, if your students don't do well on tests, they will not be your students for very long, I think. So that's a very important factor as well. Last month, we did the Aiken. Anybody here do Aiken with students? Yeah, you. This test is almost all reading. Right, even the first couple of sections, the, the choose the word or choose the sentence, that's a reading skill. Um, and also, have you noticed with the Aiken, the reading section, or the written section, and the listening section are completely unbalanced. Right? So the reading section will be, uh, which word goes in here, you know, ubiquitous, inconceivable, you know. And then the listening section will be, uh, I'm going to the park, Mom. Where is John going? Okay, so. For my students, the listening was always very easy. The reading is more difficult. So building up that side. And also the TOEIC. I took the TOEIC test about five years ago just to try it so I could teach my students better. And uh, the reading section's long, isn't it? It's really long. And most students won't finish it. There's not enough time. So again, reading is going to make a real difference for these. And at the moment, this test is probably the most important test for adults in Japan. The children, it's the Aiken, still, I think. But once you reach university, TOEIC has become most important for companies and for getting a job, and that kind of thing. This is a survey. So this was a question we asked about 400 people. Please guess who answered this, right? So they're gonna, I'll just translate the question quickly. So in your native language, uh, what is your reading habit, right? And it's, uh, I don't read hardly at all. Uh, I read twice a week or more, or I read every day. Now, who do you think answered this? Just talk to your neighbor very quickly. What do you think? So who, who is the target of the survey? Perhaps you guessed junior high school students, right? So, kind of hankorky, they're kind of rebellious, they're not interested in academics. Um, no. This survey was given to Tohoku University students. So, very high level academic students. And this was the result. So, I was very shocked to be honest. And my colleagues were shocked, the other teachers as well. Um, but this, maybe, is the reality now um, in Japan, also in England as well, but I don't have data for that. Um, so I think if we can help the students get reading in English, 
that will probably transfer to Japanese as well. So it's not just English, it's also a, a general academic skill as well. And this is the last reason why English is so important, or reading is so important for English. English is huge. It's one of the biggest languages in the world. It has 54,000 word families. Now, a word family is words that are related, similar, like uh, run, running, ran. That's all one word family. Native speakers know about 20,000 by the time they finish university. It's roughly 1,000 each year you learn. Um, and for daily life, you need about 8,000. That's to read a newspaper or have a conversation or watch TV. And 5,000 you can get by, basic communication. And 2,000 is the minimum. Basically, if you don't know 2,000 word families, you can't really use English. Right? So you can't do lots of listening or speaking or writing activities. So the, the first goal here is to learn the first two or 3,000 words. And you can study this, right? You can use tango cho, you know, like use vocabulary drilling, and just learn these first 2,000 words. After that, it gets more difficult to study, right? So the best way to learn more words is by input, by reading, or by listening. And even native speakers learn most of these words from reading. Because we don't use them in conversation. And you don't hear them in movies or on the radio. You only see them in text. And for me, this is the biggest challenge with Japanese. Because most Japanese words and expressions and phrases are only written. So I need to do a lot more reading to improve my language. So you can use words like this that tell you the frequency Right, this, this book does that. So, a reading program for children. Let's look at the components first. So we have a curriculum. This, this should be, this can be very rough, like this, or it can be very detailed. But you should have an idea of what the students will do for the next two years, or three years, or four years, or five years. You should have a basic idea of this. For us, this is what it looks like. So we start off with songs and storybooks here at the top. And this is with very young children. So with our three, four, five-year-olds, we don't do any writing with them. So we just do songs and chants and storybooks and try to get them used to listening, first of all. After that, we start phonics, which is the relationship between sounds and letters. And that is reading and writing. And then we go on to words and sentences. And we continue doing reading and writing. And then we go on to readers, which are simple books. And after that, we go on to books later on. This is our really basic program. Uh, of course, you need lots of books. This is a photo of our classroom at Cambridge English. And you can see this is 10 years of buying books, right? We didn't start off like this. We started off with, you know, one pack of uh, Oxford Reading Tree. But 10 years later, this is all Oxford Reading Tree books, different readers, story books, and so on. You need a lot of material, I think. Um, for our program, we gave each book a number. This is just so the students can keep track more easily. So each book's got a number, and we put them into sets. So this is 20 to 29, for example, and so on, 30 to... So each book is, is easy to find for the students. You also need materials, especially for the phonics part. So you'll need things like flashcards. Uh, you'll need notebooks. I think writing is very important. Um, you'll need word flashcards, and then things like posters, um, and so on. These flashcards, I just wanted to mention very quickly, are really good. I think they're new. They came out this year. 
last year. And there's a few reasons why I really like these. Uh, and I'd just like to talk about those reasons because it'll tell you some principles for making phonics flashcards. The first thing I really like about these is they're only lowercase. Many flashcards are uppercase, or both together. And I think this is harmful for the students a little bit, because students get confused, right? And for me, learning the lowercase first means that the uppercase is easy, right? So I find students find lowercase letters more difficult. So if they're going to learn the letters, I think this is good to learn first. Also, um, if they learn uppercase, they start writing all uppercase, all capital letters, right? Uh, and so I think this is excellent. They have a picture which serves as an anchor to remember the sound. So it helps them to remember what the sound is. And on the back, they've got uh, several examples of the sound. So this, these are really excellent um, teaching materials. You also need a teaching plan for each class. Now, for us, we try to keep each activity to about five minutes. So we change quite a lot. So we'll start off with uh, some phonics and then review the letters together in pairs. And then we'll check homework, do some songs, practice letters. This is a class from January. These are first grade students. So they're about seven years old. They've been studying for about <coughs> six, seven months. And then we do some vocabulary, uh, read a book, a storybook together and do a quick activity at the end to review old vocabulary. But I think the content is not so important. Um, you can choose your own content. But I think having a clear plan that continues from week to week and short activities, about five minutes each. And this is the final part of a program, really important part, communication with the parents. Because a lot of parents don't understand our teaching approach, right? They come and they say, okay, why, why is my child not speaking more, right? Or why are they not writing more sentences, for example? And so it's very easy for the parents to be, become unsatisfied with your program if they don't understand it. So it's very, very important right from the first time you meet to explain the program very carefully. And so we, we do all these things, <coughs> all five, because some parents will read the blog, many parents won't. Some parents come into the classroom after class and chat, but lots of parents don't, and so on. So I think we need lots of different ways to communicate to make sure we get the message through. Seminars we found quite useful, like once a year we'll have a seminar for the parents, invite them to come to somewhere like this and get a meeting room and just bring everyone in and, and do a quick presentation like this. Very, very useful. And of course a newsletter. But a newsletter is a lot of work. So we only do this about twice a year. <laughs> right, so how to teach children how to read. Uh, I think this is the rough order. I'm going to explain these one by one. The first thing is Phonemic awareness. This just means getting used to the sounds of English. And this skill is very easy to acquire for young children, right? They're really good at this. And basically songs and chants and repeating and playing is how we do this. So with the younger children, it's very easy. Older children, it's a bit more difficult to practice this. So we do more formal kind of drilling, like repeating sounds or checking sounds. But with young children, you just need to play and sing. But it's very important to get the sounds first before you start studying letters. After that, you can start studying phonics, so letters and sounds relationship. And we start off with single letters, of course, just one to one. And then, after that, do two letters. Now, the key point with two letters is that you do vowel consonant. 
because if you do consonant vowel, the students will switch to katakana or hiragana, kind of, or Japanese pronunciation, right? Because that's how the syllables are structured. If you keep it vowel consonant, they can't do that. So it's a much better practice for them. And then once they've mastered two, you can go on to three. Now, the one key point here, I think, is you have to start writing very early, very quickly. So after, even after doing three or four or five letters, start writing. And writing is, so they hear the sound and they write the letter. Right? Or they, because a lot of the time, if we just practice reading, they get very good at reading, but then they can't write it, they can't recall the letter. So these are two related but different processes, right? So seeing the letter, remembering the sound, and hearing the sound, remembering the letter, this is not the same. So you have to practice both. Um, you can use, now these books are also quite new, and uh, these books are not for reading. These are for practicing sounds. They're really interesting. I haven't seen anything like this anywhere else. Basically, inside the book, there's some pictures, and each picture has lots of different examples of the sound. So the students can, can using vocabulary that they know, practice the sounds. And in Japan, they can use this to learn new vocabulary. So, of course, these are for native speakers. So, in England, the children would know all the words already. They'd just be practicing sounds. But here, it's quite a good way to learn new vocabulary as well. So, I think these are quite interesting. Please have a look later on if you like. And then, of course, phonic readers. Phonic readers are books where the language is all phonically regular, phonetically regular. Right, so things like cat, k, a, t, so the students can see the word and remember how to, or, or think of how to decode it. What we do with books like this is we give them to the students in class, we don't practice, they go home, they try to read it by themselves, and then the next week they come in and they read to us, and we can check if they did it. So it's not teaching them how to read, it's checking to see if they can read. Okay, and sometimes they can't. Um, some things we do with this is ask the parents to listen and stamp something with a hand-core thing. Um, we ask the students to write out the book. Now this sounds horrible, right? Copying the book, right? It sounds like that junior high school homework, right? Copy the textbook three times over the summer holiday. Um, but it's actually quite good, I think, um, because the students, well, first of all, their handwriting gets much better. But the other thing is, they start reading sentences, or words and sentences, instead of letters. So to begin with, the students will write letter by letter. Right? So they'll write the look, the a, and then the k, a, t, and it takes a really long time. Because it takes a really long time, and because students are lazy, this is a good thing, um, they start reading words instead. So instead of k, a, t, they'll look cat, and then they'll try and write cat. And they'll speed up. So after a few months of doing this, the students will be reading a sentence and writing that sentence because it's quicker. So it's actually a really good way to get them writing like that. After, the, after they get good at reading phonics readers, and phonics readers, the, the drawback is that the content is not very interesting. Right? It, they're, they're to practice phonic patterns. But after the students can read them, we can go on to normal readers which are easy, but have a, more of a story, and they start doing more kind of sight words as well. And once the students are reading books like this, then I think it's useful to go on and do some dictionary practice. So teach the students how to use a dictionary. 
And here are some, some activities that we can help students learn to read with. And the first, I think this is very, very important. We start with the youngest children. We start doing storybooks. And we continue all the way up to junior high school, reading stories with the teacher. These are some of my favorites. Um, this one, Tuesday. Does anybody know this? Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful, kind of magical book. Not many words. In fact, I don't think there's any words in it. Uh, but that's wonderful. And then this is very popular with uh, elementary school kids. Uh, mouse paint's really nice. And this is one of my favorite stories. So I really love telling this. It's a bit difficult, though. Uh, the Enormous Crocodile by Roald Dahl. But basically storybooks. So when you're using a storybook, we'll get the students to come around. And the important thing is not to read the book, right? But to tell the story. And uh, within that telling, uh, you know, asking the students questions, getting them to predict what's coming next, uh, making links between them and the book. You know, so this is ice cream. What kind of ice cream do you like? That kind of thing just to get them involved in the book. And this is very important because one of the problems I'll talk about in a minute is students reading without understanding. Very, very big problem for our, for our program. Uh, and I think this helps prevent that because you're, you're showing the meaning of the book. I mentioned writing before, but it's so important that I'm going to say it again. <laughs> so basically, looking at a picture and writing the word, or looking at a picture and writing a sentence about it, or hearing dictation and writing. Really important. Every class we do about five or ten minutes of writing practice. And it's important to kind of speed this up. So, you know, try to minimize the kind of time wasting. So train the students first to get out their pencils quickly, open their notebook, write, and not spend a lot of time erasing and fiddling around. So if you can speed this up, it's a very useful way to practice. And we use notebooks for this, just these simple notebooks. The youngest children, this kind of eight, eight line thing, up to about 15 lines for the junior high school. Now, dictionary skills, I think, are really important. But the children don't know how to use dictionaries. And it's quite important to practice. We spend about six months doing dictionary practice. And first of all, we'll start with alphabet cards. Just Because the first thing you need to know before you use a dictionary is the alphabet order. Right? And you need to be able to find which letter comes next very quickly. So we'll give the students five or six alphabet cards and say, OK, put them in order, alphabetical order. And that's the first step of dictionary practice. We can do that a few times. With, with older students, maybe just once. They get the idea very quickly. With younger students, many times. Uh, the next thing is to give them words. So that's a bit of a jump for some students. Right? They know that B comes after A, but once you get to two words that start with A, which one's first, which one's second? So just practicing that. So we'll give them five or six words that start with the same letter. So I can put these in alphabetical order, and they'll do that. And so we'll spend a few weeks doing that kind of thing before we touch the dictionary. We have class sets. Of dictionaries. So we've got six dictionaries in the classroom. We lend them to the students. Um, and then we'll start looking up words as a race. And at first, we'll just do it in class as practice. So I'll say, OK, find this word. And they'll, they'll have a little race to find it. And then eventually, we'll start using these to help them with their reading. So when we read a book, I'll say, OK, look up a word that you don't know in here and write them in your notebook. And by the end of it, I mean, my goal is for the students to use dictionaries by themselves naturally because they want to know the meaning. Right? So it's, it's, it takes a while to build up the skills for that. But I think it's worth it 
So spending, you spend six months of five or ten minutes each class, but at the end, the students are much more uh, active in their learning. And they become independent. And that's really going to help them later in junior high school or in high school. And silent reading in class, I think, is so important. So what we do is um, I'll bring in a pile of books that I think are appropriate for the students. And I'll put them on the table and say, OK, so we're going to take three minutes read one or two or three books, and the students will choose a book they want to read and just read quietly in class. Now, this might seem like a waste of time. You think, okay, well, they can read quietly at home. But I think if we don't do this in class, the students are less likely to do it at home. But if we start in class, they will probably continue at home. It makes a really big difference. So I think this is one of the keys. Okay, so a few problems that we've had. These are the six biggest problems that we have with our program. Uh, the first one is students can't hear the difference between different sounds, right? especially sounds that are not present in Japanese. Now, there's, as long as the students don't have an actual physical problem, then more practice should help with this. So with younger children, actually with younger children, we don't really have this problem so much. But with older children, things like specific practice, <coughs> drilling, or using two um, sounds and choosing which one it is, um, Using the finger thing, so if you're doing a, a listening practice, is it number one or number two, just silently, have the students close their eyes and just raise one or two fingers to practice. But it's basically just drilling, drilling over and over again. Also, trying to say the sound, if they feel like vibrations and things. Uh, with older students, you can also show them a diagram, right? The pronunciation diagram showing the tongue and the mouth and so on, that helps them sometimes. Students don't master phonics. We had this problem quite a lot before we did writing. So when we started teaching phonics, we didn't practice writing very much. We just did look and read. And I think it's not as deep if you just read. So if you do the writing as well, it should help overcome this problem. Students don't jump to reading, right? So they can do flashcards and words, but reading a, a sentence or a book is more difficult. And I think here, we have to make the jump smaller. <coughs> so you can start off by doing sentences. So just reading one sentence. We have some flashcards with sentences on, so the students can just read the sentence, think about the meaning before they go on to books. Sometimes a book is too big a jump. They're like, ah, it's too long. So start with sentences, and then maybe two sentences. And we have some short stories. So a picture, and then three or four sentences about the picture. And that really helps make the jump to books. <coughs> and this one, this is a really big one. Students read, so they can do phonics. They can read the sentence perfectly, but they don't understand it at all. Um, and this is difficult because it's hard to find, right? You have to ask the students, you know, what is going on. And it takes a lot of time, so it's difficult to do that in class. I think there's a few things we can do here. Um, we can ask them to explain the story. Um, you can ask them to do worksheets. For example, um, give the meaning of the important words in the story and that will make them think about it. Um, you can ask them to put pictures in order to match the story. Um, there's lots of things, but basically it's thinking about the meaning in class. One thing we do, if the students read a book for homework, when they come in the next time, we'll go through it together in class and just check the meaning for each part. But not every time, because it takes too much time. Uh, this 
This is just practice. I think using a dictionary and using a vocabulary notebook, these are these should be habits. And to build a habit takes a long time. So it might take us a year or two years of, of practicing to do this. But I think it's very worth it. Some of my university students don't have these skills. And it's really pulling them down. So practicing using a dictionary and practicing keeping a vocabulary notebook or a you know, tangle job, whatever the students prefer. <coughs> And the final problem is that students don't go on to read freely. And again, obviously this, this is, uh, uh, it's up to the student's kind of personality if they like reading or not. But I think we can encourage this by making them. So it's unfree reading first. So what we do um, at our school is we say, okay, you have to read two books this week. You can choose the books, but you have to. And after a while, some of the students say, well, I want to take three. I want to take four books this time. So it's pushing a little bit and hoping that they'll get momentum. So what comes next? If, if your program is successful, within, if the students are younger, within about three years, they should be reading, three or four years. If the students are older, it's much faster. We find junior high school students take just a few months to get phonics and, and get into the reading stage. Younger students, it takes much longer, but it's, it's easier for them in the end, I think. So there's a trade-off there. So these are the things we can do afterwards. <coughs> the first thing is to move into uh, graded reading, which are more difficult. than. So for example, after the Oxford reading tree, you might go on to um, these kind of graded readers. This series is wonderful. Um, it's non-fiction, and they have these beautiful photographs throughout the book, and they're really easy. Like the, the jumps between books are quite small, so it's a really good way to start doing kind of more difficult reading. So this uh, Read and Discover series at the back as well. Another thing is listening. Now, I said reading is the most important skill in Japan because it's easy to get the input, but listening is so, so important as well. Um, there's lots of online resources. The problem is getting students to use stuff online. A lot of my students still don't have internet access at home. So it's still, you know, half the students say they don't have computers or they can't use the internet. So for those students, we just get them to come in a little bit early and use the classroom computers to do listening. But listening to podcasts or websites and so on. Probably the best website I know for listening practice is called Ello. Please have a look for this. It's free and it has about 1,200 short conversations on it, um, between people from different countries about different topics with the transcript. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource for listening. So I say to my students, just one. If you listen to one of these every day, after about six months, your listening is going to be very, very good indeed. Studying online, um, these two are fantastic for young learners to read. Starfall is kind of phonics practice, so the, the students can listen to letters or words and read stories on this website. And Oxford Owl has a lot of the Oxford Reading Tree online as ebooks. So you can read the books, listen to the audio, and again, it's all free. So these are fantastic resources. So oxfordowl.co.uk and starfall.com. <coughs> and of course DVDs. Now I think <coughs> what I recommend to my students to do is to first watch the DVD 
uh, with Japanese subtitles, and then watch it with English subtitles, and then watch it with no subtitles. Now, of course, that takes far too long if you watch the whole movie. So I'd say watch the movie, and then just watch the scenes that you like. So five minutes or so. Especially scenes where people are talking. And that way it only takes 10, 15 minutes to do this. If you did the whole movie, it would take six hours, and most students don't have that kind of time. So watching individual scenes um, repeatedly is a really good way to get your practice. And of course repeating with the DVD, doing shadowing exercises. <clears throat> and finally music. If you can get the students to start listening to music, that's a huge thing, because they will listen to the same song over and over again. These are very popular with my students. I didn't know who they were. I had to Google them. Um, but uh, yeah, if you can get the students into listening to music. Also, it spreads. If one student starts listening to music, it'll often spread to more and more. We had one girl that started, and uh, all her friends started listening to English music as well. And then free reading. Like I say, we encourage our students to free read. So we make these record sheets. Um, this is for Oxford Reading Tree. So this would be one, these are the purple books, level one. And we'll have the students just write the date and the ABC, whether they like the book or not. And free writing. I think this is a really important thing to do with junior high school students. So once students get to junior high school, we ask them to write every week in their notebook. Okay, so this is, this is one of the first tries, so you know, August. Uh, the weather, and then my teacher is Ben. I love Ben, I was quite pleased. Uh, my teacher is very, very fat. I was less pleased about this. Um, but you know, just very simple. We say to them, write five sentences. Anything. So it's, it's, we call it a diary, but it's not really a diary. It's free writing. It's a G-U-E Saku book, right? And, but this is the same student, right? In January. And <clears throat> she's made huge progress. And this is, but it, this, all students make this kind of progress because they're writing every single week. Right? So it's, I'm tired and sleepy. Uh, my brother plays the piano too, but he doesn't play very well, and so on. So you can see the huge jump in language between this and this. Right? This is a third year student. Um, <coughs> I went to a new bookstore last Sunday. It became a new store, 15th. It's in a building with two other stores near the station. Two other stores are a coffee shop and one clothes shop. I have gone to the bookstore before it became new, so I was surprised that in the store is clean and large. Merchandises didn't big change, but few new kinds were added. And there was a baby. She or he may be Clark's. So just fantastic, eh? And this, she's not very, I mean, she, the, the joke is quite unusual. Like, not, not many students start making jokes like that. but. <coughs> Fruit writing is such a good thing to practice, I think, each week. So I really recommend this kind of thing. Okay, so these are my contact details. That's my email, if you'd like to email me any questions. Or that's my blog. So I will be putting the slides on the blog uh, next week. So if you want to check that as well. And I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has a question. Um, of course, please come and talk to me in the break as well, if you have a, a more complicated question. Okay.